guest has to be one of this country's best known and best loved scientists. Chances are if you've got a question, it's highly likely that this man knows the answer. In fact, he's just written his 28th book called Never Mind the Bullocks. Of course, I'm talking about none other than the one and only Dr. Carl Krasinitsky and he joins me on the line now. Good morning, Dr. Carl. Good morning, Dr. Russell. How are you? Peachy keen, thank you. <laughs> Very good. My friend, I never knew you were a car, a, a car enthusiast or a petrol head. Um, I definitely am. I do not think of a car purely as a way from getting from A to B. Those poor souls, I think they don't actually have a soul. I think they're just <laughs> hollow shells of clay that walk the face of the earth and occasionally drive it, but with no no love. I, I, I get as much pleasure as a corner well taken at five-tenths as I do at eight-tenths. I, I, I just love the concept that our technology lets us travel at various speeds across the face of the earth and we can do it nicely and smoothly. Is that something that the, the physics of, of cornering, and we'll talk a bit more about driving and, and the sort of techniques and things like that in a little bit of, uh, just a little, a little bit of time, but is that part of the magic, you think, is getting those dynamics right and those laws of physics of flowing the car along and, as you say, keeping it smooth? You've got to use the laws of physics, but you're not thinking physics. You're just thinking intuitively and the feel Although I did have a weird experience once when I was test driving a Prius on the Toyota racetrack mm -hmm. in Tokyo, and it was speed limited to 180 k's, and it was on a banked track. Yep. Now, just to explain it for the audience, when you're driving on a banked track, it's really weird. This is my first opportunity, my first go, and so I asked some of the other journos what to do, and they said just just look at the road about 100, 200 meters in front of you, 300 meters, depending on what how fast you're travelling, because normally when you're driving a car, you, look, you see the bonnet, you see the windscreen, then the bonnet of the car, then the road, and then the sky. Mm. But when you're driving on a bank track, you see the windscreen, then the bonnet, and then the road, and above the road is more road, <laughs> and then above that is more road. If you want to see the sky, you've got to twist your head 90 degrees and look out the side. That's where the sky is. The sky in front of you, all you've got is road. And so I was coming into the corners, and you know, there's a straight, then a banked curve, then a straight, then a banked curve, and I was going around and getting the feel of the car uh, with the Toyota people in the car with me, and I suddenly remembered an equation from first-year physics, which linked, I couldn't remember the equation itself, but I remember there was a link between the radius of curvature, yep. the angle of the bank, and how fast you're going. Yeah. Any two will give you the third one. And so I started coming into the corner at about 160, taking my hands off the wheel, and then dropping off the accelerator, and the car would by itself fall down the bank a bit, then hitting the accelerator with the hands off the wheel, and by itself the car would rise up the bank. It was yeah. just naturally balanced. And then suddenly I could hear this little voice yelling at me, and I realized we were all wearing motorbike helmets, and, and it was one of the uh, diminutive Toyota female engineers saying, ah, please, Dr. Carl Sand, put hands on wheel, please. <laughs> and yet I was as safe as could be under the laws of physics. There was no need to, unless, of course, we ran across a kangaroo or some sort of animal indigenous to Japan. <laughs> It's probably unlikely to be a kangaroo there. Yeah, it's unlikely to be any animals. They would have taken care of it. So, look, the, the physics is one thing, but the sheer thrill and the love of driving. And also, I test drive four-wheel drives. And I've been doing that uh, ever since I started uh, driving four-wheel drives back in the early 1990s. And I've been, or, or in fact, late eight, 1980s, and I've been through 15 of the 17 deserts in Australia. And on our longest trip, and this is in a vehicle that we set up ourselves, we took off from Alice Springs, went west for a thousand kilometres, turned right, went north for a thousand kilometres. It took us one month to cover two thousand kilometres, and in that month we didn't see another human being. Wow! We had to carry all of our own food, all of our own fuel, which was six hundred litres of petrol we had to carry, yep. and um, a couple of hundred litres of water. And we drank one and a half tonnes of water, which we got by stopping at a well every second or third night. And sometimes the water was crystal clear, sometimes it was muddy, sometimes it had dead birds in it or headless lizards. It didn't matter what it was, whatever it was, we drank it. Wow. That's all it was. And Dr. Kelp, I mean, trips like that, I mean, they they are just, you know, they're, they're often life-changing. I mean, some of the things you must have seen on those journeys must have just been incredible, as you say, to go for that distance and not see another person. That was good, and, and what was especially good was toilet training, <laughs> because we had our little two-year-old boy and then my six-week-old daughter. Wow. And the thing about the the kids is that they don't really get to see the full going to the toilet and having a poo thing, Right. which when you're in a city, well, the adult quietly vanishes, and then there's a bit of swishing noise, 
coming out of the bathroom maybe, and there might be a bit of a few flicks of water on your hands, but that's about it. Whereas here, you know, I want to go have a, go to the toilet. All oh, right, okay, hang on, we'll, let's find a bit of shade. Drive, drive, drive. Oh, that looks nice and soft. And then you pull over, and then the first thing you do is you plug the shower yeah. into the side of the truck, and you just leave it sitting there, right. and you have the soap and the towel ready. Then you get out the shovel. Then you go out, and then you, and then you dig a hole in the ground, and then you have your bowel motion, and you put your toilet paper in there, and then you break out the matches and you drop a burning match down to set fire to the toilet paper so if the animals dig it up, uh, uh, there won't be toilet paper running around the countryside for the next you know, little while. And then you cover it over, you go back, you wash, you switch on the shower, uh, you wash your hands with the soap and then dry it with a towel and you put away the um, shovel and you continue on. So there's a whole lot, and by the age of two and a little tiny bit, my little boy was you know, getting his little plastic shovel to go and follow us, and so he got toilet trained really early. <laughs> I just say there's a little bit more to it out in the bush than it is just sort of in suburbia, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Carl, the other interesting thing, that in reading your book, which is fantastic, and I know it's out in bookstores at the moment, but in reading your book, you do talk a lot about cars, and, and a couple of, about, I guess, interesting subjects being the history of cars, which a lot of people probably don't know and, and how that's evolved. And again, from a from someone who's interested in cars and, and from a scientific perspective, that must have been a, that must be very interesting too. Um, it was amazing uh, the way that people managed to go from no cars into cars. You know, starting off in 1885, yeah. and then building a petrol internal combustion engine motorbike, and then working up to a three wheeler, and then finally making the world's first four wheeler car. So this is Daimler and Benz. Mm. And then you work your way up into brakes and then drum brakes and disc brakes and then mass production. And in the last 20 years, we've learned more about car engines than we did in the previous 100 years. And that's why cars have become larger and more powerful and yet have better fuel economy, Mm -hmm. which I find absolutely amazing. And things too like hydraulic brakes. I mean, you know, that was back in 1921 when all that started to come into being. It's something that people think, oh, this must all be pretty modern technology. And a lot of the things that we see on cars is is modern, but it's got its genesis way back then, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, even earlier, if you believe uh, Beauty and the Geek, uh, <laughs> one, one of my um, fellow geeks from the University of Sydney, uh, Xenogen, he was uh, pa- paired with a beauty and was asked, in what year... Did the jumbo jet, you know, the uh, you know, that huge seven four seven? Yeah. In what year did it first fly? And she's been given a crib sheet to learn all this stuff from, but she didn't bother, and she took a guess, and the guess was the year. 1803. <laughs> I, I saw that on TV and just roared with laughter. <laughs> oh, come on. But the, on the other hand, if you try, there's, there's other skills, you know, like there's physical skills. And, and, and I have a respect for what the Greeks came up with, which was called the healthy mind and the healthy body. And it's good to be balanced and have both. <laughs> exactly. Focus.